see you so good morning everybody and welcome to the track one and to the first talk it's really nice to have you here and our first speaker is professor olka fink she has been a swiss national science foundation professor for intelligence maintenance system at eth zurich since october uh, 2018 She's also affiliated with the MIT and the Swiss Innovation Agency as an expert in the field of information technology. Uh, before that, she was also at the Zurich University of Applied Science as a head of the Smart Maintenance Group. Professor Fink has received uh, several research grants, including the highly competitive professorship grant of the Swiss National Foundation. And in her research field, uh, some of her research field is the hybrid algorithm, a fusion of physical performance models and deep learning algorithms, uh, transfer learning, self uh, uh, supervised learning, and many other things. And today she will uh, uh, tell us about integrating deep learning algorithm with structural inductive bias and physics. So, Professor Funk, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for the um, introduction, but also thank you very much to uh, the organizers um, for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to share some of our research results uh, with you. Um, my video was, was somehow turning on and off. Um, I, I hope it, it keeps stable now. Now we can see you back. Go ahead, please. So, excellent. Um, just. So um, part of the talk uh, or part of the title of my talk um, is Digital Twins. Um, and um, the, um, the term is possibly a bit overused um, and is used in different communities for different types of applications, but also in with different perspectives. So that's why I wanted first to introduce um, how we are understanding the term. And for us, a digital twin is a living model of a physical asset or a system which continually adapts to operational changes based on the collected online data and information and, for, and can forecast the future of the corresponding physical counterpart. Um, so maybe just to see you know, what, the, what the relevant perspectives are, because we can go for the digital twins really in different dimensions and have different scales and different um, um, integration levels. So what is really important for us is the, um, this um, this type of the simulation capabilities, um, and there we are really interested in um, the look ahead perspective, uh, prescriptive perspective, uh, because we don't only uh, want to to simulate um, what um, the systems, but really um, go one step further and and, and predict. Um, and the second key element for us is really this um, uh, multi-physical behavior. Um, this is what we would like to integrate um, in, in our models. Um, and also before we start, just to emphasize what we're really interested in. So our goal is um, on the one hand to detect um, faults or to detect anomalies, but then not only to detect them, but to be able to distinguish what are the different fault types. Um, and finally, our goal is uh, not just to detect or, or to early predict, but really predict the, um, the evolution of the health condition over time and predict what is the remaining useful life of the systems. Um, so that part is the prognostics part, um, and this is what I'm going to start with, but I will also show you a part of the diagnostics part. So um, detection is rather, um, or, or this one can be solved possibly even without complex physical behaviors, um, but particularly for prognostics, this is where we are lacking um, the prediction capabilities, um, where we're just going purely data driven. Um, and as already indicated in the title of the talk, um, our goal is not just to use data to develop um, the, the digital twins or um, our, our models, um, but also to integrate physics in it. Um, and um, depending on where we are in the scala, so on the one hand, we can have small data. Um, on the other hand, we can also have um, you know, big data. And we, we, um, we can also know lots of physics, um, or we, we cannot have, know anything about the system that we're actually considering. Um, so depending on where we are in this continuum uh, with these two dimensions, on the one hand with physics and on the other hand with data, we can combine the two and let the two benefit from each other. Um, so what, what we are um, typically assuming is um, that we are, um, or, or currently for the example that I will be showing you, 
uh, we, we are assuming that we know lots of physics um, and we know some data. And so it's, it's kind of um, this direction. Uh, but um, what you also see, we, we typically lack labels. So that is one of the challenges um, that we are facing. So uh, we are particularly in this regime. And when we start integrating physics with data, there are different ways on how we can do that. Um, and this is where we're trying to integrate bias in our models. And there are different ways, again, how to do that. And for example, one of the ways is when we are um, integrating observational bias, when we are, for example, expanding our input space um, by, um, by particular physical observations. Um, and this is um, we, we, we will be looking into. But again, there are also other ways. And for example, um, the um, quite well known um, physics and formula networks are in the um, setup of learning bias. Uh, where we're integrating um, the physics, the known physics as part of the objective in the training algorithm, um, and then really um, training the algorithm to follow the known dynamics. Um, but we can also do inductive bias. This is one of our current research directions uh, where we are inter where we are using models um, that are um, already integrating part of the information um, of the physics-based model. And um, for example, graph neural networks um, can be considered. Um, a structural inductive bias where we're integrating this information already in the models. So as I already mentioned, there are really different ways on how we can combine physics with deep learning algorithms. Uh, we can start um, kind of simple with substituting a model, um, physics-based model with a surrogate model and then still contain the entire um, physics-based system. We can have discrepancy term. Uh, we can even try to learn and discover governing and, um, equations. Um, we can use physics and formula networks. What I will be sharing with you today is particularly that part uh, where we are um, having in parallel a physical um, physics-based system model, and we are developing a hybrid algorithm um, that predicts for us um, the, the quantity of interest. Um, so that will be the part that I will be focusing on. So the framework that we were working on um, is, is fusing physics um, and deep learning algorithms. And what we typically assume um, in this framework is um, that on the one hand, we have a real process. And this real process is monitored by sensors. So we have sensor readings in real time. And on the other hand, we have access to a physics-based system model that is typically hierarchical, where we have some components um, that are aggregated at higher level. And what we are then doing is we're using the information um, contained in the sensors uh, or the, the sensor information to calibrate our physics-based models. Um, and then we are using this calibrated system model at each point in time to predict for um, or to, um, to estimate for us uh, what on the one hand um, the, um, the measured parameters, um, but on the other hand, we're also um, using information, the virtual sensors, and also on the calibration parameters. And then we are feeding that data into a deep neural network to predict what is the remaining useful life or uh, what is um, the, um, the, the, the underlying um, um, bulk mode that we're interested in. So that's um, the, the, the general setup. And, and just to, um, to, to, to deepen a bit um, the perspective, um, so uh, while we are interested in predicting the remaining useful life, and we are assuming that we have physics-based models. And um, an assumption could be or um, interpretation that we could possibly have um, access to some uh, models that are modeling for us the degradation. However, this is typically not accessible for complex systems. Um, so this part, when we are able to model the degradation mechanism, is particularly available for rather simpler systems where we have a deep understanding um, on how um, different processes are actually um, impacting um, the system behavior and, and really are able to model this at different degrees of, um, of granularity. However, what we are now looking into, uh, we are not assuming that we have a physics-based degradation mechanisms that we are able to, to model, but rather that we are able to model the smart macro level impact of the degradation mechanisms on our performance model, on the performance of the system. So we are assuming that we are not able to, to model the degradation, however, we are able to, uh, um, to have access to a physics-based model with which we can actually monitor what the impact of this um, of the different faults is on the performance of the systems. Um, so this is also why we are not, um, even if we wanted to substitute our hybrid models with pure physics-based algorithms, 
We are not able to do that because we, are, we don't have direct access to this degradation. We are only indirectly learning it. Um, so this is opposite to the, to the left part uh, where we may have, um, we may be able to substitute it by degradation model. Um, so let's dive in into um, a bit more detail. So we were particularly um, looking um, into um, turbofan engines um, and we're um, aiming to estimate the remaining useful life of the component. And typically what we assume is that we have some access to previous behavior um, of those engines um, and then we are using this information to predict the remaining useful life. Uh, plus, we have um, the information on the engine data and the information on the operating conditions. Um, and even if we, um, even if at the beginning all of the engines um, behavior and health estimation may look um, quite similar, um, depending on how they operating uh, operated, they may degrade in very different uh, way or in many different many different conditions. So this is why we really need to track this behavior um, and and to monitor at this um, at the at the level of a specific component of the specific um, turbofan engine. So, as already um, introduced at the beginning, uh, we, um, we assume that we have a system model, uh, we have a real process, and we are using um, the operation parameters as input to our calibration model, um, um, to our system model, and then we are calibrating the system model. And what we get out of this um, system model is, on the one hand, the estimated um, um, observations, um, and this is um, how we're actually denoising our signals as well. Um, on the other hand, we get access um, to virtual sensors that are not captured by the real process. Um, and what we are using on top as an input um, are um, the calibration parameters that are actually quite informative um, of the degradation condition of the system condition um, of, um, of the turbofan engine. Um, so we have three components that we feed in. So it's the, um, the process parameter measurements, um, our chili denoise version of them. Um, then the virtual sensors that are um, inferred by the system model, and additionally the calibration parameters that are again part of our system model. Then we feed it in into our um, deep neural network and predict the remaining useful life. Um, so we uh, we evaluated it on a case study um, of, of turbofan engines, and here is uh, where we collaborated with NASA, who had actually, or, um, who actually developed um, this commercial modular error propulsion system simulator. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the field of prognostics, um, there have been for a long period of time the CMAPS data set um, that was really used um, for quite a while as a benchmark data set. So we recently released the new data set that is, um, that is larger, but also that is supposed to be um, more um, adapted to the real conditions. For example, we used um, real flight conditions from a commercial flight uh, from the NASA dash link. Um, so to make the behavior more um, or resembling more the, the, the real behavior. Um, so for this case study, we um, we used um, uh, nine turbofan engines. Um, and six of them we used um, as a training data set, and three we used um, for testing. Um, so this is just one um, one flight envelope that you see here. Uh, we had two failure modes. On the one hand, the HPT degradation, and um, for the second one, it was HPT and LPT flow and efficiency degradation. Um, and uh, we had, um, so now you see uh, kind of squeezed in the, um, the different flight envelopes. Um, so um, all, the, um, all the engines were flown until the, um, the, the, the end of life, um, and then three were used um, for prediction. Um, so that's just a short overview um, of the um, 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 estimated of the simulated flight envelopes. Um, and, and just a message um, that you see here, so um, the three last units we used as a testing data set, so it's 11, 14, and 15. Um, and one of the units was, uh, was really behaving quite similarly or was operated quite similarly to those used for training. So this was also for us a test. Um, to evaluate how well the, um, the, uh, the algorithm was able to generalize um, to, um, to operating conditions um, that were not um, used for, for training. Um, and also um, unit 15 was also operated a bit dissimilarly compared to the, um, to the training units. Um, so this is really where we wanted to evaluate the generalization ability of the algorithm.
Um, so that's the detailed framework. So again, uh, we, are, we are having the, the real process observations um, and the operating conditions. Um, we were using um, the um, unscented um, Kalman filter to calibrate our, um, our physics-based performance model. Um, however, we also propose to use here um, reinforcement learning algorithms. So that box can be substituted by any calibration um, algorithm. What we are just interested in is to have the um, the, the estimated output um, of um, the virtual sensors and the calibration parameters um, coming out from um, this um, this performance model. We are then concatenating them. Um, what you see here is just the architecture um, of a convolutional neural network. However, we also compared it um, to, to other approaches as well. Um, and we train it to predict the remaining useful life. So that is uh, one target prediction that we train the neural network um, to predict. Um, so if you weren't, um, this is actually um, can be considered um, as a digital twin, and then we're using the output of the digital twin to impose this um, prescriptive capabilities where we're looking ahead and not just simulating um, the, the behavior of the system. Um, that's how it looks like when, when we use, um, so this is just for the normal feed forward neural networks and um, we're just taking the inputs at the current point in time and then we're predicting the remaining useful life. Um, so for the data driven, what you see here, um, the performance um, is, is not that bad. Um, but if you take the hybrid algorithm that on the one hand it converges much faster, but on the other hand also the, um, it's, it's uh, much more certain uh, within on, on the system conditions within the, the flight envelope. Um, if we take the convolutional neural networks, um, it looks already for the um, purely data-driven a bit better um, than for the feed-forward neural networks, since we are also now taking um, more information as, um, as input, and also um, time information. Although if we then look into the hybrid algorithm, then it, um, it performs then even better um, than the convolutional neural network. Um, so now just for the, for the numbers, so if we take the pure um, the, the feed forward neural network, we are able to improve the hybrid with the hybrid algorithm the performance quite significantly. Um, if we take the convolutional neural network, um, we are also better here. So um, the way there are two uh, performance um, um, performance um, evaluation metrics. On the one hand, it's the standard root mean squared error, and on the other hand, it's the scoring function that was actually proposed to be used uh, within one of the data challenges by NASA. So that's why we are also reporting um, those numbers here as well. Um, and, and on both of them, it, it improves the performance. Um, we also compared it to LSTM, since this is one of the um, algorithm that um, is um, uh, taking also the time information into consideration. Um, it performs quite similarly to, to CNN, however, CNN is performing a bit better um, compared um, to the LSTM. And, and for all of them, the hybrids, so when we use this augmented input um, to the neural network, it improves the performance um, of the algorithm. Um, and what we are actually interested in as users is when are we really sure about the remaining useful life? So what will be the end of life of our component? And this is where we consider it. So when is the algorithm within the error about um, of five cycles? Um, and for that one, if we use the hybrid algorithm for these three units, uh, we were able to improve this um, prediction horizon um, quite significantly for unit 15. It was just by 50%, but for the two others, um, it was by, um, by, by about um, 200%. So on average, it was more than 100% um, improvement, which is um, actually quite nice for the users. Um, what we also wanted to evaluate is um, what happens if we decrease the size of the data um, of the data set. Um, so, um, in the first step, we were using um, six units um, as input for our training data set. Um, and then we decided um, to just um, halve this training data set. So, it um, takes still four entire unit trajectories, um, but then just take the, the unit 16, 18, and 20 as input. And we only evaluated it for, uh, for the convolutional neural networks so since this was the best performing algorithm. Um, and if we did that, um, so for the data driven, um, the performance dropped um, well, um, quite, um, qu quite significantly. Um, if we took the hybrid algorithm, um, what you see here, the performance actually stayed more or less the same. Um, so depending on which metric we take, so it's either plus two or minus two. So it's, um, we were able to keep the same performance with the data set that was just half as large as, um, as we used in, in the first step. 
Um, so that was for the prognostics part. I was I will know, I also wanted to show you shortly um, what we are um, also able to do for the for the diagnostics part. And before I dive in, I wanted to introduce just the concept that we are typically using. Um, so uh, what, what we uh, normally use for the detection part that we use an out encoder that is reconstructing its own input, then we um, we use the um, the compressed feature representation as input to the one class classifier. And this one class classifier is not a binary classifier. Um, we, we have a continuous output and we can interpret this continuous output as the distance of the training data. And if our training data was healthy, then we can really interpret it as, um, as a health indicator. And once we detected something, uh, we can actually go back um, to this um, to the out encoder, and then we can use the reconstruction errors or the residuals um, of the output of, um, of our in, um, reconstructed input, and then um, evaluate which fault patterns were actually occurring for us, and which um, so and distinguish them this way between the different fault patterns, because depending on what type of, um, of fault we were observing, we will have then deviations in different signals. And doing that, we are then able to distinguish which, which fault types were actually occurring. Um, so that's just how it could work. Um, we can train the neural network on the training data. Uh, we can then um, uh, validated or on the validation data, we can then um, uh, put the, um, the threshold that is um, then indicative for us uh, what is the expected um, value for um, for healthy conditions, and then we can start monitoring it. Um, and once it starts deviating, then we can detect something. But what was also nice about this framework was that we are actually able to distinguish between different severity levels of the fault. Um, so this was um, kind of the initial fault, and this was um, a second level fault, and this was for uh, for a generator of uh, um, of a nuclear power plant. Um, and then we are also able to distinguish which of the um, signals were the most impacted. And based on these signals, we can actually present this information to the domain expert who can then um, help us distinguish in which fault type it would be expected. Um, so in this case study, we again worked with the two of an engine model. Um, however, now we just looked at one or um, of, of in one to um, in one engine, not in several, not in a fleet there. So we had before for the prognostics. Um, so there were um, 24 flight cycles, and now we had um, snapshots during the different um, flight conditions, so during climb, um, cruise, and descent conditions, um, and this is what we actually use for training. But now we also wanted to, to compare the performance. So this um, framework is already familiar to you. This was the was that we're actually using. But now we also wanted to compare it to a different one. Um, so we are not able to do that for the prognostics part. Uh, but what we can actually do, um, we, we can use the system model um, to um, kind of as our autoencoder. And then uh, what, what we can also then uh, monitor are the, um, the deltas or the residuals between the, the estimated signals. Um, and the, the real observed signals. And then we can use this as, um, again, as an input to our one class classifier, um, to our neural network algorithms. Um, so it's quite similar concept. However, now uh, we, we are not using the, the model calibration. We are not using the virtual sensors here. Um, we are just using the system model. We are predicting um, the, um, the estimated outputs. Um, and then we're using the, um, the delta between the two um, as input to our neural networks. Um, so that's the two models that we're actually monitoring. Um, and as indicated, what we actually do is, um, so we use this as an input to the neural network. Uh, we then um, develop an out encoder. We take the, um, the compressed um, latent input space and this input to the one plus classifier, and then monitor the one plus classifier. Once we detect something, we then evaluate um, the, um, the residuals um, from, the, um, from the predicted signals here. And then um, this way we isolate the signal, um, the, the fault types. Um, so we also compare different uh, um, algorithms here. So this is the normal autoencoder. This is variational autoencoder. This is one class classification um, support vector machine. Um, for the purely data driven, the performance is really quite bad, irrespective of which algorithm you're actually taking. For the residual base, um, it already performs actually quite well. Um, if we take the color, um, the hybrid calibrated, the performance is even better compared to the residual base. Um, but I will show you just in a, in, in, in a minute uh, where actually the difference comes in. 
Um, but we also wanted to, um, to, to treat the data driven algorithms also fairly. What we did was, um, so when um, the data driven algorithm actually struggle quite a lot when there's a high diversity in the input data. Um, and so what we did was split actually the different operating conditions and then we just took those uh, with, the, with the high altitude values and then we trained the model based on it. Um, and what we then um, observed was um, then if we did it um, in this way, uh, sorry, um, if we did it in this way, then the performance really improved actually quite significantly. So this is where we took all the data and this is where we um, you know, just took those um, with a high altitude um, and then the data became more homogeneous and this is where the data driven uh, models also started performing better. Um, however, the hybrid were also able to perform in this um, heterogeneous um, data regime also really quite well. And this is now where the difference actually comes in, um, because we're not only interested in detecting, we're also interested in distinguishing between the different fold types. Um, and if we just took the data-driven algorithm, um, so um, these were the isolated signals that the algorithm was providing us as an input, um, as output. Um, so it already indicates for us what, what the fold type would actually be. Um, for the hybrid algorithm, it could pinpoint it actually quite precisely. For the residual base, unfortunately, there was quite a spill over um, over the different um, residual signals. Um, so it was indicating it a bit, but it, there was also a spill over. Um, but where, where, where the real difference was actually uh, really worse. Um, so for the data driven one, it waited or it took it quite a while um, to have a high intensity of the fold to be able to distinguish between the, um, the different residuals. And the hybrid was actually um, already providing very good um, uh, isolation performance, um, even with, um, with very low intensity um, of the faults. Um, so just to wrap up, um, we are able to improve on the one hand um, the performance of the algorithms. Um, what I was also um, showing you is that we are able to reduce the amount of training data that we are using. Uh, we are also able to improve the generalization ability. So, for example, for cases where the systems were uh, performing um, uh, quite or we operated quite in quite a similar ways, um, but also improve the transferability of the models within the fleet um, and improve the transferability. Uh, and with that, I actually wanted to show you also um, kind of some glimpses on what we are currently working on. But um, I would also like to leave some um, some time for for one or two questions, hopefully. Um, and then um, I will give over to Mohammed. Then. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So uh, we have a few questions, so I hope we can do it in the five minutes now. <laughs> so the first one from uh, Michael Malon. Uh, prediction accuracy metrics for RE time series are often misleading, uh, given unsubstantiated confidence in the model prediction. How did you verify your prediction to real life behavior? Um, well, actually, um, I, I can answer two answers to that. So um, we were only using um, simulated data for this case. Um, so while we were using real operational conditions, um, so on the the um, the model, so so this was just simulated data. However, you're, you're absolutely right that point predictions are actually particularly for our for remaining useful life and for prognostics are, are not the best uh, prediction estimator. Um, and in the meantime, we have also extended it. Um, we worked with um, deep caution processes um, and, um, and Monte Carlo drop up neural networks um, where we're not just pr um, providing um, a point estimate, but also um, um, the uncertainty of the prediction. So that is one of the directions that, um, that we extended it to. Um, however, I did not have time to, to present it here. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question what are the, uh, from Ralph Steinhagen What are the options for online, offline? or extrapolatory based learning algorithm for system where a precise physical model doesn't exist or too complex uh, to be modeled efficiently. What would be a good strategy for that? Actually, um, I can maybe um, go back to, um, to that slide. Um, where, I was, um, where I started introducing what the different options are um, and as, as I indicated, we were assuming that we had quite a, um, a good physical system model, um, but also, for example, currently we're working on approaches uh, where we exactly don't assume that, um, where we're trying to develop um, quite precise target deep learning models, but then again, 
Um, what, what is missing, what may be missing in this one is the extrapolation capability. And this is where we still try to integrate um, part of the bias, um, um, kind of some, some basic physics assumptions. Um, and this is where um, this part can actually come in. Uh, because really, one of the channels, if we have um, a sim or a simulator or a digital twin, what we actually expect it to do is to also behave well or to to have good prediction outside the training data set. And this is what, uh, what is typically quite challenging. Um, however, if we integrate part of the um, inductive bias um, or, or learning bias, this is where the models can also extrapolate a bit better and, and behave better in regions where we did not have much training data. Um, so it's not going purely data driven, but integrating um, some um, basic physics partly. Um, or here in this case, what, what is done quite a lot is integrating um, partial differential equations that are known. So um, yeah, depending on the, on the amount of information and knowledge that we have, there are different ways to approach it um, and, and to substitute um, those pure physics-based models also to, um, by, by deploying algorithms that are induced um, by, with physics-based behaviors. Thank you very much. Uh, a very fast question. Uh, are these frameworks available uh, as open source or um uh, one of the challenges is that uh, the NASA model is not available open source um because the, this was uh, this is proprietary um but what we actually released so we released the entire data set and the entire data set contains um the the, the virtual sensors the calibration parameters and also the estimated the, the real observations so that is available so the physics based framework is not available and we also have released um um, um and notebooks uh, where we take this as input and predict so um the the physics based part is not available because this belongs to NASA uh, but for the rest around it is available so, in fact, there is still a lot of questions, but unfortunately, we cannot take all of them. Uh, but we have okay. in the, so you see, the people are extremely interested in the very nice topic. Which we have. Um, but but uh, please feel free to drop me an email. So it's a very exactly. simple email. And, uh, it's opink at ethz.ch. Yeah, we have the break uh, out rooms at 11.10, I think, after the poster session. It would be great if you are available there, and then we can continue with the question and the sure. discussion. I'll be there. Uh, Eleven ten. I'll be. I'm Thank sure. you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark, for sharing. Thank you very much. It was a great talk.